Well, we thought uh, we'd have some, uh, some heavy thinkers here now for a change and uh, take a small break while Jules and I get a moment of rest. And uh, we're, going to, uh, we're going to have some thoughts by three people, three very important people, about uh, why we should be going to the moon. Here's Bill Moyers, the editor of Newsday, Marshall McLuhan, the philosopher of communications technology, and Ian McCard, the a regional planner, amateur ecologist, author of Design with Nature. ABC's Howard K. Smith asked, her, asked Mr. McCard about the motives that send Earthmen to the moon. I would give all honor to the astronauts and NASA for this, you know, phenomenal adventure, but it seems to me there are two motives here, one of which is good and the other, I think, quite bad. One, the, the, the good motive is uh, the increase in man's knowledge. Uh, the bad motive, I think, is the, the motivation of conquest. And uh, I think our attitude to nature has been throughout the whole Western tradition, one of conquest. We talk about conquering Mount Everest and conquering the moon and conquering space. And we have, you know, traditionally this whole culture, thick, low-brow, dull-witted, uh, territorial, uh, laying bludgeoning strokes across, uh, you know, the world-like body, destroying and singing peans of self-praise as we go. And I think there is a, an aspect of this, you see, in the conquest of space, that it is really based. It's the that, same witless... It's metaphoric, so When man. you say the conquest of space, you mean it's a metaphor. Oh, I think it's not a metaphor. I really believe the Western tradition does believe that man has a moral duty to mm -hmm. conquer nature. I mean, he is exclusively divine, or so the uh, Genesis tells him, given dominion over life and non-life, and joined to subdue the earth. And by God, the whole Western tradition, Judaic and Christian, has tried to give the best evidence of this uh, dominion and subjugation that it possibly can. And uh, the conquest of space is just one of the spin-offs of this arrogant, anthropocentric, witless, clottish man who insists on in subjugating the earth and all creatures. I don't look at it that no, way. I was going to ask I, you. I, I, cons I think man is essentially an explorer. He's always reached out into the unknown. And Mr. McLuhan said earlier that uh, if something can be done, it will be done. And man is going to determine that uh, he can do this. I think it is not a, a greedy, asp uh, avaricious reach for something that he would like to control as much as it is for something about which he would like to know more. And I think as long as there is something unknown, man will be trying to reach for it. What I've learned from all of this is that, that man also, as a political animal, has the capacity to organize himself and his peers in such a way to attain a goal that uh, a decade ago seemed to be impossible and seemed to be forbidding. And what I hope that we can do from this is to see the difference that exists between what we've done in space and what we yet have to do on Earth and organize ourselves to ach achieve the goals which will affect the lives of billions of people on the Earth uh, as well as the, life that, the lives that will be affected uh, of the few men who will make it into space. Wouldn't Bill, you were in a high place in government at a time when this program was launched. Uh, do you think that it's been a wasted effort, that the money, it has been a perversion of resources and skills? No, I don't for this reason. We were not doing very much in the social and domestic field in the late 1950s when we were not searching for the moon or reaching into space. Uh, we have done more uh, on Earth since we have been doing more in space than we ever did in the decade before. That's a, a syllogism perhaps which proves nothing except the fact that, that, that this nation is so wealthy and so rich that it really has the capacity to do what it will organize itself to do and what it establishes as its priorities. But, Mr. Moyer, have you considered that the Russians, who have never had a 19th century, who have many less resources than we, have also accomplished more or less the same goals in space? But at a greater price. You see, their, their, G price. their GNP is such that they could not carry on a consumer revolution at the same time we have been doing that. All right. Uh, and so but they I had to give uh, up something. I don't think we have to give up something. I think we do, because it is so much easier to reach a goal that has few political obstacles in front of it than it is to try to do something about some of these problems which have political it's just a kind of luxury for us to play with these things whereas it's well, life and death for the russians no no it's not life and death with them they they, they made it a matter of, of life and on death the other hand, the allocation of their very meager on, resources on the other hand with sputnik they created a very witty pun which was carried out visually little fellow traveler they put this little fellow traveler as an environment around the planet, a planet that was terrified of fellow travelers, and uh, they put a little one out there to reassure us that it was friendly. They didn't and create the pun, Mr. McLuhan, you did. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the word Sputnik means little fellow traveler in Russian. 
and it was done at the time when fellow travelers were t uh, rather a menace but, but in they our did it for a very esoteric group of men of whom you are the paramount chief. Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm very flattered, but I, I, I heard that from a great many other people. I didn't uh, probe into the etymologies of the word. But it is, uh, I, I, I think it's worth considering, uh, since they do have a sense of humor, uh, what the uh, Russians had in mind in uh, the complementarity of this current effort. Uh, oh, yeah. I think they've all, I think at least in the beginning, uh, Mr. Smith, they had a, a military purpose behind their space effort. And I think this is one of the reasons that uh, our leaders at the, that particular time, particularly in 1960 and 61, uh, were motivated out of a sense of reaction, even to some extent fear, which has been translated into the prestigious reach for uh, 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 to be first in space. But I, I think they really had serious military motives behind well, their uh, are there, efforts. When you say serious military motives, I, I, I shouldn't think military motives half as serious as many others, including educational. But uh, when you, you, you attach the word serious to military, I, I don't. It can be attached to almost any war. Well, there yes. are many military efforts that we're making that are not serious in the sense of our relevance. You don't think of in, the, in the, uh, the relevance. think of Apollo 11 as having any relation to our own military oh, interests. By all means, the uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, present head of the Apollo program, who is a general, mm -hmm. uh, indicated today that he will be leaving the Apollo program a few days after uh, the the flight in order to go back to the Pentagon to apply the techniques he's learned in the Apollo program to our defense effort. Well, well I think. To go back to your, one of your first questions for one second, you said, what is the value of this? Well, there are many esoteric values that are still to be realized. There are many long-range projected values that the millennia will realize, but the immediate value is military. Let's face that. The practical, significant application of our space effort, if it has what any about, pragmatic what, value whatsoever, is basically ask, military. Let's ask ourselves in long-term uh, projects about the meteorological possibilities of the conquest of moon space. You better ask him. Can we consider the possibility of space platforms that might be might serve the control of climatic conditions eventually on Earth? Uh, the uh, I haven't the finished idea. I'm the wrong man to ask about this. I do know that uh, satellites orbiting the Earth, of course, can have an enormous utility. They they now have uh, elaborate sensors. The Interior Department is going to send up another satellite. Is it not Eris? And uh, this uh, beautiful creature will be able to uh, monitor the Earth continuously, and we'll be able to observe uh, things as delicate as the amount of carbon dioxide or the, the pr productive fertil fertility or health of crops, uh, uh, sedimentation in rivers and so on. The whole dynamism of natural processes may be continuously monitored. It, this it material could be put in, digitized into computers immediately, and that material could be used by people like me to make regional planning decisions. And this is enormous uh, social utility. A historical moment, a historical point here. Uh, back in the early days of the space effort and, and even into the acceleration of the Apollo program in the early days of 64 and 65, uh, the men who brought to the president, to the White House, uh, the projections, the facts, the research figures were very realistic about the pra immediate practical effects of this whole program. Uh, as far as interplanetary travel is concerned, it will remain for generations to come a very esoteric uh, uh, feasib that, uh, feasibility for the very simple reason that it will be a long time and take many billions of dollars before we can develop uh, the kinds of programs that will make interplanetary travel a vehicle that will make inter interplanetary travel available to more than but, three or four uh, minutes time. To go to, to the Mars, for example, is a two and a half year yeah. round You're, trip. Mr. We Boyer, haven't yet you are working on the assumption uh, that uh, for present forms of fuel and hardware are indispensable for such travel. One of the reasons they want the, uh, the specimens from the moon is to yeah. see to what extent yeah. minerals exist in the moon right. and the quantities of moon material that but can be used for space fuel. They may not exist, but, but that's one of the purposes. It's uh, not at all likely that we're going to continue our present forms of fuel for <laughs> earthly transport, let alone interplanetary <laughs> transport. Uh, we can tell oh, by saturation and pollution that we're reaching a terminus in many areas of use of materials. Uh, and uh, at any time, like the automobile, we know the automobile is, uh, we're no, we don't know why, we know it's finished because technologically it has become such an incredible nuisance. But by the time any form of human activity becomes surfeiting and sheer pollution, then you know a, a big change is handy. The hidden uh, change created by moonshot is the creation of a totally new environment for human knowledge. 
Well, thank you very much indeed.